Okay, welcome. Thank you, everybody. Um, our presenter today is Ian Williams. Um, Ian is a LMSW. Ian Williams is a student in the PhD program in social welfare and the advanced certificate program in interactive technology and pedagogy at the CUNY Graduate Center. He is a program social media fellow with the Graduate Center Digital Initiatives and a 2022 to 2024 Haystack Scholar. Ian researches the intersections of technology, human service organizations, and social theory. Ian holds a, a master's in social work in organizational management and leadership from the Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter College and a BA in East Asian Studies, Cultural Studies, and World Religions at McGill University. Um, Ian, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Sean, and thanks everybody who's joining us here today. Um, I'm excited to be here. So first, thanks to Haystack for hosting me and having me as a scholar and giving me the space to workshop my ideas. And thanks to everybody who's kind of helped me along the way and think through it, uh, including my wife, Melissa, who was doing some last minute proofreading. Um, she, I consider her my most ruthless editor in a very good way. Um, but, you know, I know things are not going to get an easy pass. Um, so this is a very in progress talk. I feel like I heard birds chirping in the background somewhere. Interesting background. Anyway, it's, you know, it's a very in progress talk. I kind of threw it together to think through some issues and problems that I've been observing, but haven't really had a platform to work on. Um, and I think this project really kind of sits at the nexus of like my education as a social worker interested in looking at technology I and mean, also someone who I think is really loving and sort of re-embracing the humanities, uh, particularly at the Graduate Center. And it was a really rich DH community and culture there. And uh, the ITP certificate has helped me to kind of think very differently and think about technology than one tends to in like a social sciences perspective. Um, so it, it really kind of focuses on the, some of my explorations of text to image generation or what's often called AI art or AR imagery. Um, and it comes from about nine months of more kind of active participant observing in this. Um, I've been observing it for about a year uh, and thinking about AI for about three or four years now, actually. Uh, it's kind of amazing to think that it's been that much, like that much of a sustained obsession or curiosity. Um, so a lot of the images here, like most of them, except a few screenshots, uh, are ones that are generated from prompts that I crafted or entered. Um, I will not claim artistic ownership or authorship over them. I think it's a much more complicated process, which makes it much more interesting. Um, but those images were generated either from Dolly uh, version one or two or Midjourney uh, versions three or four, uh, which are two platforms and softwares. They use algorithms to generate imagery from text prompts. Um, first, I want to situate a little bit of uh, the background and what it is that we're talking about. Um, and then I'll talk a little about my kind of method and approach and then look at a couple of social case studies uh, and collaborative efforts, which I'm seeing a few familiar names in the guest uh, in the conversation here too. So I'll be excited afterwards to hear what people think. Um, this is very much my take and my interpretation, but I'm curious what others who've also been experimenting uh, and collaborating have to say. So first thing though, I wanted to just note is that, no, is it not? Sorry, my screen just blanked out, but can you see the second slide here? Okay, you can. Yeah, so today is the International Trans Day of Visibility and Jamie Shelton at the Silverman School of Social Work uh, along with the Silverman Center for uh, Sexuality and Gender uh, put today out as a kind of a social media campaign to raise awareness and support and trans affirming messages. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment in the space here to highlight that uh, and encourage you to check it out. Uh, you can look at the Twitter hashtag social workers for trans justice um, and add your own trans affirming message. So I think it's very important for us to all be in support and you know, Haystack Scholars is very much about social justice and education. And this is one way to center that a little bit before I go a little bit more deeper into nebulous spaces. Um, so I've looked at a couple of images 
um, that have come out of AI generation, and both of those have come out of mid-journey. Um, but I want to just ask, you know, what are these? And what is this thing that we're looking at? You know, how can we relate to them? How can we examine them? And what can we do with them? And what are they on their own terms? Um, I've been wondering about this for a while now, as I think about the images and the, the infrastructure in which they exist. Um, and I first started seeing AI generated imagery on Twitter uh, through Dolly. Some folks were posting kind of early access and beta release um, imagery at the time it was invite only. And Jonathan Singer, who I see here, I see here in the group, uh, was one of the people actually who had access and had been posting stuff. Um, and it really interested me and some of the other media studies and aesthetics folks were posting about it. Um, and it was kind of just in the background. And then over the summer, I started reading about it more, having a little more time. Um, and I landed a fellowship of the Graduate Center Digital Initiatives where I had to manage social media and be more active on it. Um, I feel like it's still very much a work in progress, but you know, it forced me to be on Twitter more and started to play around with more. And I was like, oh, then I got access to Dolly while it was still invite only. And in some ways it felt like my experience with Facebook where you know, I got access when it was school only um, but my university, I went to McGill for my undergrad, didn't have like the first you know, layer of access, but it was a second or third. Um, so I've had an account for a very long time and it felt similar, but things are moving much, much faster you know, for this general purpose application of this new technology that is also kind of a social community. Um, so it's interesting to me in part because my journey as a social worker, um, you know, I got involved in the field. I was doing a lot of nonprofit and community work um, out of college and trying to sort of make a sense of what I want to do with my life and how I wanted to, I guess, live a good and just life and try to help people, um, try to do something that seemed to have, you know, a leaning towards making the world a better place and a more just place. And in my studies in social work school, I became very interested in how social workers use and think about technology. Um, and how technology integration works in organizational settings. I had a lot of operations and administrative jobs coming up to getting my MSW. And my focus was on management and organizations. Um, and I really kind of went with the organization side. So I started looking at how MSW students used and accessed information and communication technologies and how that, you know, kind of mapped out compared to like their agency settings where they're doing their internships or what's called a field placement in social work lingo uh, versus their personal use and it was very very intriguing to me uh, and it just kind of sat in the background while i was working as a social worker doing clinical work um, but always getting pulled into various technical projects always getting asked you know hey can you figure out how to run this report can you train a new person how to run this database or how to work it um, and then COVID-19 happened and all of a sudden like all of these questions about technology which it seemed often gets and it still feels sometimes gets like put in the background in social work training and education I mean there are so many concerns and priorities that we're responding to and tech resources are often underfunded in the contracts and the you know the structure of organizations themselves but nonetheless all of a sudden technology was in the foreground and technological change and innovation um and it just really interested me. So I started looking at telehealth and then started thinking more and more about AI and then went into school to kind of develop a research agenda around this. Um, and it's been a lot of kind of self-directed thinking uh, about that. So it, it's taken a very interdisciplinary perspective. And I'm really glad that I don't have a tight 15 minutes to think about here. So looking at that, you know, our object of inquiry and study, right, is AI art or AI generated imagery. Um, and this screenshot was trying to capture the process and it was very early in my experimentation. This is from Crayon, which is uh, based off of Dolly 1, uh, which is then an open source version called Dolly Mini. Um, but I here tried to give a prompt in text, as you can see, a pickle eating hamburger on sidewalk. I was trying to go for a slightly surreal image I kind of wanted to see what it would be like if a pickle was eating a hamburger. I wasn't expecting to see the thing that I imagined. I was just curious what would happen and how it would interpret it. Um, and 
usually in these softwares, multiple versions of an image or a iteration of that are generated and you kind of pick and increasingly you can kind of enhance or manipulate or make variations off of them. So the actual process of generating images is often like a put in text, see the image, refine, craft. It might be altering slight bits of instruction. Like in this version, I gave no aesthetic criteria. So it just assumed that it was going to be a sort of photorealistic image. Um, but if I had said, you know, oil painting uh, or ink and brush or a particular style, um, you know, an artist or a school that's in the training data, then it might try to replicate that or might guess based on it. So the image data that it has is kind of this like decomposed visual information um, that's coded and encrypted and, or not encrypted, but coded and like put into a database and into a system that like makes sense for the software in a way that doesn't really make sense for humans. Um, you know, a big piece of AI and artificial intelligence is that the way that it thinks, whether you consider that conscious or not, is very different than human cognition. Um, and there's lots of different positions one can take on that. I'm not trying to make an argument about that here, about the nature of consciousness or you know, the uniqueness of humanity versus machinery or the threats thereof or whatever. There's plenty of discussion about that. It's more just like, how does it work? Um, but you know, some of the other images in here have a more deliberate style. And you've already seen that in the two and you'll see that in the others. But again, I just thought this was kind of cool and interesting um, and a weird snapshot from a different time. Because also when generating images, there's always a degree of randomness, which is determined by the mathematical structure of the algorithms themselves. So it's not totally random, but you know, neither is flipping a coin to decide what, uh, you know what direction to go which is something like john cage used that in some of his musical decisions but there is a, a chaotic random element to it of just putting in something and seeing what comes out um and it's the algorithms that are the rule-based systems and software protocols that, like make and shape the output and the outcome um, but there's a few components of the technology and particularly in computer technology and software that's worth thinking about right like one is text to image generation um, which itself in some ways is just a form of information visualization or data visualization. Um, it's taking textual data, which then gets interpreted. And in this case, like string data that then becomes numeric and the algorithm itself that then creates an image. Um, and, you know, there's lots of other precedents of that. The technology of this really started in the last, I think 2017 was kind of the first example of like this kind of text image prompt. Um, there's also computer vision, right? Where like computer software is imagining what visual data looks like. Uh, and again, pulling that off of what it's already been trained on, what the sources are. I mean, what it imagines a sort of end user, ideally like a human audience would see, although the human is not the only possible audience. Um, there's also natural language processing, right? So like natural language, someone is giving instructions in a language that it's not necessarily technical, it's not written as code, but it's interpreted uh, and broken down in that. And there's an aspect of diffusion, right? Where like, again, the data and the images are disaggregated and then re-aggregated in new forms. Um, the infrastructure of that are very, very large data sets. Um, and particularly with AI imagery, it's data sets that use uh, like their visual data sets. Um, and that's where it kind of gets complicated and interesting and controversial in a ways. We'll get into that further down the road, but all of that data is used to train software to make a kind of guessing game and make calculations. Um, over time, those calculations are accelerated through generated adversarial networks where like multiple bots or entities will test and guess to try to produce and predict outcomes. Um, but it's you know kind of a form of thought uh, or a form of calculation and automation. And there's a lot of that in there that's still kind of mysterious even for the computer scientists and software engineers um, that are actually looking at the code. And a lot of the code is proprietary and is not open source. Um, it's another big problem we'll get to down the road in the conversation and something I'm also thinking about. Um, but you know what we're looking at and what I'm thinking about is the process and the experience of interacting with this 
um, and what it's like, like what comes in, what comes out, what that whole process is like, what it's been like for me. So in terms of my orientation, I'm just slowly loading here. I think there's a lot of hype uh, and a lot of tension in the discourse around AI and AI imagery um, and algorithmically generated imagery. And it's a little exhausting as someone who's on Twitter a lot. Um, it's just kind of like endlessly following the hype cycles and the hype cycles and the kind of affect of it really vary depending on the discourse and the space. Um, a lot of what we are seeing is a, a degree of hype in the sense that like the power or the influence and the inevitability of AI as some kind of social or technical force gets thrown around, you know, either as a positive or a negative thing um, from a lot of the sort of big tech uh, and like AI safety world. Like there was a letter that was circulating earlier this week that you know, was out in the New York Times calling for a temporary pause to large language model uh, development for the next six months, often looks at the future of AI as generally a kind of predetermined endpoint, or at least one where like AI will continue to grow and continue to have a, a power and uh, influence, but it's often seen as an externality um, and therefore like the human elements of it, for instance, you know, the corporate ownership structures um, or the university industry research pipelines that might produce these things or the intellectual property laws uh, and trade secrets laws that might protect companies or the lack of regulation is kind of bracketed out. Um, it's just like technology and AI is sort of its own thing. Um, and that technology is generally framed as a, an inevitable and desirable solution to many social problems. Um, I think Meredith Brossard in her book, Artificial Unintelligence, um, described it really well as something called techno chauvinism, which is this assumption like a task can always be automated and outsourced and it will be better when a uh, machine or a technology does it. Um, and that's very built into that bias uh, and that worldview. And another strong worldview, so I have the, you know, this protest image here, right? There's a robot on the left and a person on the right, you know, on the other side, especially in the AI world, art world is, you know, a strong backlash against uh, this, right? And against the sort of encroachment of technology into human creative spaces uh, and livelihoods um, or the use authorized or unauthorized of certain uh, intellectual property or data to replicate or create or automate work of current people, uh, currently live people and artists. Um, and there's a kind of craft guild notion of protecting art and protecting secrets there too um, that is very interesting and sometimes concerning, especially when some of the voices uh, represent, you know, intellectual property interests that are, don't necessarily benefit uh, human culture at large, but are much more about like protecting established entities. I've seen a lot of those voices on Twitter recently. Um, I think there's some, something more to the story of human creativity and technology there, particularly around like remixing and sampling, you know, other, other types of tools. So my own methodology, again, asking what is this? And this image actually came out of Dolly from a response that chat GPT gave me, I think explaining that it was a large language model and not a person and not able to uh, give certain kinds of judgments. Uh, but anyway, I thought the image was, was interesting kind of thing. So how I'm looking at this, um, again, I'm not trying to make a strong argument. I'm not trying to say like, this is declarative, this or that. I'm not thinking about it from a perspective of like scientific rationality or, or uh, Kind of instrumental rationality and i'm not claiming what lorraine dawson calls the the view from nowhere of objectivity in particular like the scientific viewpoint um i'm thinking about the view from somewhere and that somewhere is me um, that is my experience you know as someone in the the kind of disciplinary and academic space that i am at as a first generation doctoral student um, as someone who finds a lot of value in narrative thought and reflective thinking and in social work research uh, and scholarship, one of the big voices in that perspective is Stan Witkin, um, who's written a lot about autoethnography as a kind of narrative truth production. Um, and he's been a pretty strong critic against the dominance of certain kinds of scientific or like evidence-based uh, models of research and practice going back to like the late 90s and or late, late 80s and early 90s. Um, there's an interesting figure and uh, his work, I think, is still quite relevant. 
and in a recent article he mentioned how it seems that it's been a little strange to him that it hasn't taken off but a lot of that might be like the institutional infrastructure of research itself and academia um, but i think there's some value there of thinking about knowledge in terms of its local and partial uh, experiences and embracing that um, and thinking about that too like particularly when we look at knowledge and truths like i am not you know a marginalized person in most of the sort of identity categories that we think about like a matrix of oppression um i'm a pretty privileged person in many ways i mean i would say that as a doctoral student there's a lot of exploitation within the hierarchy of academia of grad students and particularly public education um it's a lot of austerity budgeting conversations and all of that but you know when it comes down to it, i'm not necessarily that person but others doing similar kinds of inquiries might have perspectives or truths that are really worth revealing and might get washed out in generalizability uh, or making claims about a universal truth or an average truth. Um, so that narrative reflection, it's also just kind of coming out of the way I've studied this, which has been this kind of periodic participation. Um, but I, I think it's, it's worth considering and worth kind of walking with me through this journey and this kind of visual essay. And I would love to hear what people think about it when I get to the next. So, sorry, my image on this side is leading to a weird wash. There we go. So, from that perspective, I'm really looking at it in terms of two case studies, because um, case studies are very compatible with qualitative style of research and ethnographic and ethnographic research. But it's also like this is where the experience and the data has been, um, and writing about it from my perspective and from a kind of autoethnographic, I'm also making claim about my perceptions in my experiences. So people who participated in the same processes might feel very differently about some of the outputs or the experiences. And I don't want to claim to know or claim to speak for that. Um, and I'm really curious about what others think. I think that kind of multi-perspective collaboration could be really interesting. I also think there is probably a perspective about the trace of the software and the data itself, not knowing what it's thinking or how it's expressing that, you know, it might have its own kind of interiority or subjectivity. It might have its own perspective, um, which again, in most cases, we're not able to see that because we don't see the code, we don't see the process. Um, but I, I wanna include that too. Um, so the first case study, an example is looking at visual annotation of text um, so in my class in the fall on interactive technology and pedagogy it was a history and theory course we're using a lot of new technical tools um, one of them was perusal which is a social annotation software it's similar to hypothesis but has a lot more uh different kind of structure a little more guardrails i'd say um, but we were reading texts about technology from kind of historical, political, and theoretical perspectives. And one of the foundational things was looking at Karl Marx's Capital Volume 1, and specifically uh, Chapter 15, which is about machinery. And there was this, like, there's just really, really rich language in his writing. Um, and they just wanted to know what would it look like to visualize this. And it was around when I was experimenting with Dolly. You know, and we have to do something to participate through the reading and i'm like well why don't i do something different use a different kind of media instead of just commenting um, so i fed this passage uh, which was about uh, a steam engine uh, in section one which just said a mechanical monster whose body fills factories and whose demon power at first veiled under the slow and measured motions of his giant limbs at length breaks out in the fast and furious whirl of his countless working organs um, and there were other iterations that it also produced, but I like this one in part because I thought like this would be sort of a weird NFT style image, like it has a very like web art look. Um, but it was just interesting to put in there and see how people responded and see how my instructors responded. Um, and they seemed pretty receptive to it. Um, this is another quote from Marx. I'm not going to read the whole text because I want to go through it all, but same from the same source. Um, this is from Wolfgang Schivelbusch's book, The Railway Journey, which was fascinating. He was actually uh, like Frankfurt School kind of cultural theorist in Germany who then wrote this whole book about the sort of formation and emergence of the railway system and its like effect on space and time. 
it's a fascinating book. Um, but again, like these very rich descriptions. And I'm like, well, what does the image look like? I think this was about the landscape, uh, the boredom of the landscape. Uh, the transformed by railways and like standard as well. Um, another image. Sorry, I'm having this loading problem again. But this one is from Donna Haraway's essay, A Cyborg Manifesto. So I've been practicing for this for a bit at this point, um, getting pretty positive responses from my professors, Jimena Gallardo and Gina Ray Foster. And Gina is my Haystack mentor. Um, and Jimena also was a, she was on the board of the Wikimedia Foundation for quite a while, and we'd already like done a workshop on using Wikipedia. So what kind of coming out of this, I think, especially embracing like the irony and the playfulness of Haraway's essay, which, you know, is really kind of refusing an essential subject position, um, an essential subject position as like an agent of history. So she was writing against a certain kind of socialist feminism of the 80s and thinking about like, what can technology offer? I mean, like human machine hybrids. Um, but anyway, Humana and Gina encouraged us to make these images and then display them as a kind of Halloween gallery. That was very playful and very fun. So we all, or a bunch of us made it images. Um, and then Humana encouraged us and kind of walked us through the process of uploading those images to Wikimedia Commons. Um, so they're all Creative Commons copyright um, licensed. So they're basically for free use. Um, and anyway, it's just this very cool and interesting weird thing that just came from playing around and throwing something in and saying, oh, what happened? So the other case study uh, is social work AI art. And I see a few people who are also participating in this here. Um, so I'm really curious about which I will think, but basically like my recollection and my sort of experience of it is that I started to connect with uh, people who largely organize around the hashtag like SW tech, so social work tech. A lot of them are like social workers and social work researchers who are really kind of excited and curious about new technologies um, and tend to take a like, let's experiment and see what happens uh, and also interrogate uh, through the lens of social work ethics approach, which is really fun and interesting. Um, it's just kind of like finding a community that's like, oh, yeah, this is, you know, this is one of my homes in social work. Uh, but I saw that there was a call to organize this kind of game and thread focused on social work AI art. Um, and I'll just put the link for that in the chat. Um, to do it first as an experiment in December, where every day somebody would host uh, a thread of a sort of social work themed concept or image, um, and then encourage others to also post. Um, and I, you know, again, it's kind of an experiment. It's like, it's sort of a game. It didn't have like a sort of top-down purpose or it didn't have the the kind of research design of something that might be like, well, it has to, you know, know what it's looking for beforehand. It's like, hey, let's just play around, see what we can do. Um, and it was really quite fun and very generative. And so I'm just sharing some of the images that uh, came out of my participation, but you can look up the hashtag on Twitter. Uh, it's still going today. That there's a thread I need to add something to. Um, but, you know, these are often like, I think this was being lost in a maze of bureaucracy was the concept. So sometimes people throw out a concept or a phrase. Sometimes it's more uh, social work focused, like representations or images of social work. Sometimes it's a little more abstract or esoteric. That's where I tend to go. I think that's my aesthetic preferences and biases. Um, and, you know, maybe I blame that on having artists and craftspeople parents or reading too much postmodern theory in my 20s um but you know these are just a bunch of images that were produced um, but i thought you know coming from this there's kind of two main perspectives about all of these case studies there's the pleasures of it like it's fun it's innovative it's creative it's kind of magical in some ways and like uh, similar to Gibson's concept of affordances, right? Like new technologies create new possibilities. Um, but I think there's a real like pleasure element to it. And I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the author. This is something I have to work on. There's a really interesting essay I read about data visualization in the, in the academy. Um, and it was written in a journal of television studies. And the authors were looking kind of critically at like the role of data visualization in uh, 
academics in the kind of context of neoliberal austerity and like especially i think a lot of the humanities and social sciences like facing this pressure to seem relevant and to have to like justify themselves through infographics and like new forms of communication um, which like i think there's a lot of relevance to making academic work more accessible and more interesting as like a dissertation is a very long uh labor of intellectual love and who actually reads it uh it takes a lot of time uh, often like written as a, a form of expression so like other kinds of ways of thinking and writing like even experimenting with using these images in the presentation as kind of a new fun way it's probably a lot more fun than like a standard powerpoint i wanted to have like minimal text um but anyway the author is like they got at the point that there's a pleasure in visualization and they were looking at designers and particularly like information designers and how they approach thinking and how they approach the work and like saying that you know academics also toil a lot for labors of love and maybe there's more in common there that we should think about um, so there's a lot of fun there's a lot of possibility um but there's also perils right um you know we're opening up we're not really opening up a black box we're kind of playing with these various black boxes and again some softwares are out and about um all of this is like proliferating new kinds of imagery in the world uh, at a very rapid pace and i think in mid journey i had almost 500 different jobs which are like image generation jobs and any new prompt generates four images um so thinking about just like the sheer quantity i mean we already have like proliferating and kind of overwhelmed by images like selfies and instagram graphics like it's not entirely new but just the acceleration of that and the kind of fun of that like there's an energy cost and a resource cost to that first of all um also because of the way in which the software works right it's like replicating or it's generating things based on what it has um based on probabilities based on the information it's given uh the data sets so all of the biases, um, all of the structural inequalities that go into aesthetic and artistic canons and like knowledge systems are being reproduced in new ways and new forms. Um, so there's concerns about that, right? There's concerns about like the effect of the value of skilled labor when something is automated, like who benefits from that. And there's a kind of further privatization of aspects of the internet and like the digital commons when we're using proprietary infrastructure um, especially things that are often being put out there as like you know beta testing right so it's all kind of like large large software testing that we're participating in but like who's benefiting from it who gets it who gets the infrastructure um who gets the goods and i think there's also like some serious risks of disinformation um and this concept of hallucinations that's used a lot in talking about ai and computer science so basically like you know an image like dreams up something like disinformation i guess a, a easy way to split the two is like disinformation is usually deliberate um and might be like used for human ends and actors so it might be like a kind of propaganda um or some kind of psyops but like hallucinations are just things that like you know an ai puts out there and then it seems to be believed as real because of how we relate to the information um but they're interesting concepts and they're concerns to pay attention about um and then there's also just the question of like what happens with all these images um you know it's not like again energy wise there's a lot of resources and energy that goes into training and maintaining these things and the companies that support that often don't want to talk about that um again it's not part of the future where technology reigns supreme um so a few different threads to to kind of roll through in a few different perspectives or themes one is labor um going back to the concerns about artists and the questions of skills like who gets to benefit from the skills um whose work is valuable whose creativity is valuable you know there are people who have kind of made careers or like new identities as like prompt engineers or prompt crafters people who are doing like ai art and selling themselves as ai artists others are using a term called synthography um which i kind of need to put the reference in here for um but it's like more about the method and the process of synthesizing new digital information but there's questions around there about like what are the hierarchies that are being implicit like what is the creativity of value? i mean it would be nice and i wish and i feel like it is possible we could live in a society where we could spend a lot of time just creating things based on interest and curiosity 
and not needing to constantly market ourselves or survive or play into a gig economy. Um, but we need a lot of structural changes to get there. Um, and in the meantime, we need to just ask questions. There are also questions of power um, and the power of platform capitalism, the power of big tech, um, you know, the power at play in our experiences of this and in my experience of this. You know, um, I think just maintaining a critical attitude about all of that is really important. And in some ways, that's a very different approach than thinking primarily about what the thing can do or what ends it can serve. Because I think another power perspective, I haven't really been able to dig into this in this talk, um, but I'm thinking more about it as like, you know, what is the the non-human and like the subjugation and power of that? Um, David Gunkel, who teaches at Northern Illinois University, has written a lot of interesting things about the idea of like the rights of robots. And he's a Derridian deconstru deconstructionist who's also a computer scientist. Um, so he's coming from a very different perspective, like challenging the anthropocentric notions or the assumption that like technology must always serve human ends or needs. Um, but I think that's, you know, another wrinkle in all of that's sort of worth digging into. And there's also just questions of media, you know, and like how new kinds of visual communication are occurring, uh, new circulations of that, questions of aesthetics, um, and the existence of that in network society. Uh, Lev Manovich has written a lot of really interesting work on this, on new media communications. Um, and in social work, Jimmy Young has written a lot of interesting stuff on new media literacies. And that's worth thinking about. Um, and organization theory, there's a piece of that too, of like, what are the structure and kinds of organizations that, you know, this work is happening and these images are both existing and proliferating in. And, you know, thinking about myself, what are the organizational settings and contexts that I'm doing this in? Um, and how does it change organizational structures or hierarchies? So, you know, for instance, in like a nonprofit, uh, say that is very strapped for resources, like there's a, a sense of, okay, like there could be innovation of using these things to save time uh, to produce more, but also like, how does that restructure the labor? How does that restructure the hierarchy of knowledge and power? Um, and again, you know, what kind of platforms rise within that or platforms do organizations become dependent upon? Um, so just in terms of closing it out, you know, I wanted to go back to a few open questions and then I want to just talk um, or I want to, I want to talk, I want to hear what other people have to say. Sorry. I've been talking for a while. Uh, so first, you know, I've thrown a lot of perspectives and questions out there, I think to challenge the notion that there is like an objective perspective or a singular truth. Um, but I wonder how others feel about that, both about like the images and the process and the technology. Uh, Cause again, I'm coming from my perspective, um, in my way of thinking which is very partial, very particular, um, very subjective, but I find value in it and it helps me think about stuff. Um, and similarly, like, can we say definitively what these are, you know, what is their essence, um, both as like technology and aesthetic objects and processes? Um, and what is the value or the importance of making stakes in that or resisting it? Um, and given the speed at which this has just kind of diffused in a society and like, these new kinds of innovations have been adopted. Um, is it possible to slow them down? And what might that look like? Um, and is it possible to opt out? Because a lot of the time when these things get presented or these other materials I've seen, especially like, you know, webinars or stuff, it's like, oh, what is this? There's kind of no notion of resistance um, and no notion of like refusal to participate or refusal to go along or replicate and clearly I've taken a stake that I think it's worth it to play and explore. Um, but I also think that there's value in resistance and value in not just kind of embracing the identities of the new kinds of subjectivities or relationships that are produced by these things. Um, and, you know, another question I do have is like, am I doing anything other than just like beta testing software? And I wonder what others think about that. So I'm going to stop my share. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ian. Um, I had a few questions um, and comments as you were presenting, but I want to um, give space to folks in attendance first. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. The 
it was really interesting and fascinating. Um, something that Adashima shared, I'm not sure if she's still with us right now, is that um, they hadn't really thought much about the intersections between AI and social work together. And your presentation really um, presents this in a really interesting and fascinating way. And had, they had a question about how you came into this research area. Huh. Well, I think that question is kind of just through dabbling. Um, I think I like, like I said in the in my sort of narrative, like I've been interested for a long time in technology use and integration and social work, um, and I think that came actually what what really sparked it for me is that I was working in supportive housing um, in New York, and I had moved to a new job to do my field placement because I was going to school and working in an agency, and I had a supervisor who was way overworked and I had to train them in using a bunch of software, but also using Microsoft Excel. And in some ways I was like kind of baffled by like something that seemed like a kind of common tool. I hadn't been taught from someone like working in the field. Um, and I kind of just went from there. I started reading a lot. I started thinking about it. It's always been this like minor thing. And I'm sure those of us here who are in the kind of social work tech world know, like it sometimes seems like a relegated thing or it's like, tech can be treated as like one of many concerns or kind of like the furniture in the background. Um, but I think if you focus and highlight and foreground it, there's really interesting things to say. And like, I think a social work perspective has a lot to add to the conversation um, at the same time as I think it challenges some of the norms, um, maybe even of like the world that social work is kind of built upon. <laughs> exactly as Jonathan said. <laughs> In social work, if you know one thing about technology, you are identified as the tech person. That is so true. So actually, my first job at a grocery store, I was 16. And actually, it was when I was 15. But we had a, a training. I'd watch a video on a laptop, and the sound wasn't on, and nobody could figure it out. And you know, I was playing around with computers and the internet a lot, whatever. I figured out how to fix it. And then the general manager thought that I just like knew everything about technology. <laughs> so it really is literally that like being good with tech is a weird, valuable skill in social work. I mean, now like I've been learning a lot of coding and programming in the last couple of years, um, which I still feel like I know nothing, but I guess I know enough to know what I don't know. Um, like it's just kind of been this weird obsession. And I think part of it too is like, you know, I came to school to study with my mentor, Jim Vandenberg. Um, who like is a very interdisciplinary, he calls himself an undisciplined thinker. Um, and he was very interested in like willing to kind of encourage me to pursue my own passion, um, which I think I've been felt very supported at the Graduate Center in part because it's a pretty interdisciplinary program and like research isn't directed by funding through grants or like existing projects. So it's kind of just been like, yeah, I just follow this obsession and this is where it goes. Um, and then challenge myself to try to make something out of it through like a project like this. Like I hadn't written anything about this three weeks ago. Um, while we're, are there, if there are any folks who um, have any questions, please raise your hand or enter them in the chat. Um, I'm just gonna kind of respond to some of your presentation while folks are getting their questions together, Ian. Um, when you were presenting about the um, perils and you raise questions about labor and power with um, regards to AI generated art. Um, mm -hmm. It made me think, you know, I, before I went to grad school, I um, was a community organizer. And um, when I was doing that work, I really like read and learned a lot from the work of folks like James Boggs and Grace Lee Boggs in Detroit. And mm -hmm. they used to write a lot about, I mean, at their, in their time, like the technological advances were you know automation on factory lines um, and the threats to labor like automobile labor and um, in, in Detroit and like what that meant for both like the uh, um, you know folks who are organizing to try to like preserve a particular um, access to work and economic lifestyle but then also the possibilities of if we are not tied to this type of labor, you know, if machines are replacing people off the off the factory line, then like what are the opportunities um, for the type of work that we might imagine in this new world? And I, I felt like your presentation really kind of spoke to that in a, in a different time in a really interesting way. 
Um, I'm not sure if there's a good question, <laughs> um, but just wanted to share that. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to hear more about um, what your thoughts were on what struggle looks like in this arena, um, what struggle or resistance might look like in this arena. And then I also see that Jonathan has a question too. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I think, though, so thank you for the comment and the question, because I think that also really helps historicize some of these struggles and like, there was another, this is where I just have to like write notes, right? And this is where this is very much work in progress. Cause it was like some interesting conversation I was a part of on Twitter about like the perpetual presentism of a lot of the tech discourse, especially from like within tech where these problems have existed before, like the problem of automation, of de-skilling of labor, of like the effects of industrial or post-industrial transformations on society and on people, which I mean, one could argue that a huge part of social works formation as a profession and as like, you know, kind of an entity in society was responding to industrialization and like the kind of destabilizations that came from there. Um, but in terms of resistance, Dan McQuillan wrote a really interesting book called Resisting AI, an anti-fascist approach to, I think it's an anti-fascist approach to artificial intelligence. And like, he advocates essentially like refusal to participate and support um, in a very interesting way. And he essentially argues a more extreme version, like the replication of reality that goes into automated systems um, is the logic of austerity itself. And so there's an in infrastructure dependency that goes on there. Um, and he also argues a lot for like mutual aid and protest and participation outside of it. Um, I don't know, personally, I think I'm still trying to find a place because I also struggle with this thing of like, I like playing around with new technology, you know, like I like learning this stuff, you know, I, video games were very meaningful to me as a teenager, uh, chat rooms and like playing around on the internet you know, like things that I couldn't do before, like help me to discover a sense of myself or express it. Um, but also none of that comes free of all of these other material conditions. Um, I do think like refusing, well, one thing, I mean, if taxes were more equitable, for instance, or like taxes uh, were enforced right like all that's the other i think the big piece there's another um good essay called the californian ideology that was put back out in the 90s it was kind of a leninist critique of like the tech you know libertarianism at the time like i think it's a lot about like engaging seriously with this and maybe alter articulating alternative technological practices um like i think that's the other piece right like sometimes the terms luddite gets used in a very pejorative way to talk about like, okay, well, people just don't want to think about tech or they don't like it, but it actually means they want to resist the forms of automation that cause harm um, or perpetuate inequality in like class-based structure. Um, but I think it's an open question. I think maybe that having the question is a part of it. Um, thanks for that. Um, Jonathan, go ahead. Yeah, um, well, first of all, Ian, it's, it's uh, nice to see you. Um, as a living, breathing person and not just a, um, a profile picture. Uh, loved this presentation and love all the um, uh, um, uh, the humanities that you brought into this. Um, the, you know, you were talking about autoethnography and sort of this experience of this. And I was just wondering from the, from your experience with the social work AI art um, game or whatever we call it, um, uh, if there are ways that, or what ways you started thinking about the relationship of, of social work and um, technology differently uh, through that process. Oh, that's a very good question, Jonathan. It's, likewise, it's nice to meet you as a living, breathing person represented through the screen. Um, I will say Jonathan hosts a really amazing podcast called the social work podcast. Um, and there was a great discussion back in 2020, like a video that you hosted, uh, about social works, possible response, um, to black lives matter and like calls for police defunding and abolition. And like, I've used that in my teaching in social welfare policy. It's such a rich and interesting debate. And I think it's very relevant to like the haystack community and a lot of the concerns here. Um, so I think one of the things is that we're all coming at it from a very different point, right? And like, I think I'm 
in some ways like retreating into academia and the university. Um, like I'm not practicing as a social worker. I guess one could say that, I, you know, use social work skills and knowledge in teaching um, and in like how I think about things. And like the students that I teach are practicing in the field, you know, they're MSW students. Um, but I think sometimes it's easy to like, like the humanities thing, that's my intellectual playground is that world. Um, like I'm sitting in on a class that's on critical theory and like Italian philosophy right now. And we're like, you know, we read like Giorgio Agamba in this week and are talking about homo saker and like these like very abstract and esoteric questions. And my professor is saying he teaches a bioethics course where there's a lot of nursing students. And I'm like, wow, how do they respond to that? Um, so it's interesting to see because we're all experimenting with new tech and new tools in very different ways that I think like, it's almost like whatever comes to mind, right? Like it's not quite a Rorschach test, but there is this thing of like, it's generative, it's improvisational, it's not constrained. I think social workers are often very hungry for that because social workers tend to be very creative, improvisational thinkers and actors and organizational and like professional practice constraints as well as just like sometimes the exhaustion of dealing with wicked problems in society takes away from that. So it's interesting to see how people are thinking of like, how can I use this in implementation science or how can I use this to like really test and iterate and see like, what is this technology mirroring back or what prompts do I need to like reflect a reality that is my own experience or the world that I want to advance and live in. Um, and what are the questions? And then even like, what does social work uh, look like in this practice? You know, what do social workers do in the world generated by these images? Um, so it makes me very excited in that way. And like, I think it reminds me that like, there's a unique space and voice. And I think there's a lot that we can do to kind of amplify that and bring it into interdisciplinary collaborations and like other spaces and also work in, I think in some people like tech and product development, um, you know, or other ways that maybe that's not what I'm doing right now, um, but it would be fun to see where that goes um, and just encourage people to play and experiment. That's great, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. I think we might um, have time for one more quick question if anybody has a last minute question for Ian. Um, if not, I just want to give a quick um, shout out that I dropped Ian's social media handles in the chat if you are looking for a way to stay in contact with Ian and follow their work and research. Um, and just to give a quick shout out that our next Digital Fridays will be, oh, and thank you, emails, the Ian's email address is in the chat as well. Um, our next Digital Friday will be in about a month, um, Friday, April 28th, um, same time. Um, any last minute questions though before we wrap up? All right, if not, thank you so much, Ian. This was such a interesting, thought-provoking presentation. Great job. Really looking forward to um, your work as you continue to think through and experiment with your way through this. <laughs> um, really yeah. great. Thank you. Well, if anybody has further questions or wants to talk more, just reach out to me because I'd love to chat. Um, I'd love to get feedback. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, thanks for listening to me blabber on for an hour about this. Um, let's go make some AI art images and uh, post our images in support and love of trans solidarity. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>